Coming up on this episode of the Locked On Bucks podcast, we are going to get into our final preview of the Buccaneers against the New Orleans Saints. We have a couple of interesting voicemails that we want to go ahead and get to, especially with a certain deadline looming ahead. All that and more coming up on this episode of the Locked On Bucks podcast. You are Locked On Buccaneers, your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to the Locked On Bucks podcast and thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen or watch every day. I am James Yarko, joined as always by David Harrison. You can find everything that we are doing over at BucksNation.com. Follow along on Twitter at Locked On Bucks, at JayArko underscore Bucks, at DHarrison82, and at Bucks underscore Nation. Head over and check out the YouTube channel. Subscribe while you're there. We are free and available on all platforms. Thanks to places like McDonald's. Yes, this episode of Locked on Bucks is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Thanks again, Bucks fans, for making the Locked on Bucks podcast your first listen or your first view if you're joining us here on YouTube. Today, we're talking about injuries, we're talking about predictions, and we're going to hear from some members of Bucks Nation as we close out the week, looking ahead to this weekend's matchup between your Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the New Orleans Saints. James, let's start off with the injury news for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers not participating in practice on Thursday. Antonio Brown, D. Delaney, Jason Pierre-Paul, and Steve McClendon, although Steve McClendon was just a rest day, so no concerns there, but obviously some concerns with Antonio Brown missing practice yet again for a second straight day this week after missing last weekend's game. Limited participants, some good news here. Levante David limited in practice on Thursday. O.J. Howard also limited Richard Sherman. So potentially Richard Sherman, Levante David working towards getting back on the field. Full participants, Gio, Giovanni Bernard, Jamel Dean, Rob Gronkowski, full participant at practice, Anthony Nelson, and Indomitian Sue. James, for the Buccaneers side of things, what stands out the most, what concerns you, and what makes you Incredibly happy Gronk. Um, I'm mostly concerned about D Delaney. Uh, they're thin enough at, at corner, and you talked about last week if if D Delaney can be a starting corner in the NFL, then Todd Bowles could be a player of the game. Well, absolutely, D and a Super Bowl MVP, I think. D Delaney was a starting corner, needs to be on the field. They need that help there now. If Richard Sherman can go, it might be a little bit of a different story. Uh, Antonio Brown's not playing. He's not playing. Best case scenario, he's going to play against the Washington football team after the bye week there on November 14th. Uh, I think JPP still plays. I don't think we're going to see JPP practice the rest of the season. He's going to save it up. He's going to go all out on Sundays or Monday, depending on you know if they have that game. But I, I think he plays without practicing for pretty much the rest of the year. Excited to have Gronk back, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And then for the New Orleans Saints side of things, not participating, Andrews Pete, who obviously is not going to play with that pectoral injury, Dwayne Washington, Taysom Hill, Peyton Turner, limited participant, Deont Deont Deontay Harris, uh, the the uh, unwanted uh, receiver of Jameis Winston's anger last week as, as the Saints played the Seattle Seahawks. Full participant, Marshawn Lattimore. So obviously he's going to be out there to try and terrorize Mike Evans uh, some more in there, a little back and forth since they both joined. The NFC South, what stands out there from the New Orleans Saints side of things? Um, obviously, Andrew Speed is going to be the biggest one. He's, I, I believe Ross said he's out for the year with that pec no. injury. Uh, fake Tebow not playing. It's whatever. Um, Marshawn Lattimore, it's funny. For those of you on Twitter, Greg Allman had a really interesting tweet about Mike Evans' numbers against the Saints before mm -hmm. Marshawn Lattimore and since Marshawn Lattimore. And they're actually almost identical. So Lattimore really hasn't been the reason that Evans has struggled historically against the Saints. Um, it's just kind of the team that he always struggles against. You know, he has by far the fewest receptions, receiving yards and touchdowns against the Saints compared to the other division rivals. But it's not because of Lattimore. It's just kind of what it is, kind of like Tom Brady yeah. versus Eli Manning. You know, like it's just exactly. one of those unexplainable things that just kind of happens in the world sometimes. You know, I, you mentioned uh, Tebow Light, Taysom Hill. 
not participating. I'll, I'll tell you what, and, and I'm not saying this is happening because I don't know where he's at in concussion protocol, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to like sully that process or or make light of it. Sure. Um, but I wouldn't put it past Sean Payton to to DNP Taysom Hill all week and then roll him out there Sunday as an active player trying to take the Buccaneers by surprise somehow, trying to find some way to get the upper hand on on this division rivalry and, and try to help get his team a win because that's just that's the kind of the sneaky thing that Sean Payton would do is, is he would he would work up some sort of mix sneaky package to try to surprise the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And of course, if uh, if there was a place that was actually going to make that type of product and make it well, it would be our friends over at McDonald's, the title sponsors for today's shows or today's show and a partner here at the Lockdown Podcast Network brought to you by McDonald's. Proudly serving communities since 1965, McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends and family can come to reconnect. Win or lose, it's a place where teammates, competitors, the home team, or the away team can come to recharge. Cam Jordan, Tom Brady, sharing a Big Mac after the game. Hey, it, it could possibly happen. Um, no. Head to your local McDonald's now yourself to reconnect to your friends or your family. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Back now for segment two of the Locked On Bucks podcast. Wrapping up the week. Thanks again for making the Locked On Bucks podcast, your first listen or first view every day. You know we've got you covered on all things Buccaneers. But with the trade deadline right around the corner, don't miss our live NFL trade deadline show. Reaction to every move, plus a second half season preview, and much more. Catch the show live from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time, November 2nd. That's Tuesday on the Locked On NFL YouTube page. James, speaking of the looming Trade deadline. We've got a voicemail from a member of Bucks Nation talking about that very topic. Hello, this is Anthony from California. And um, with the trade deadline looming, I've been seeing a lot of posts on social media and stuff. And I saw one on CBS or something um, where it had us potentially, you know, just thought of trading for Marcus May safety from the Jets for a fourth round pick. And they got me thinking, would it be worth getting a player, you know, um, especially the defensive one that has to learn the, the scheme and all that stuff. And who, if we do trade for someone, who do you see us trading for? I don't think we trade for anyone just because the team's so stacked. And once people start getting back from injuries, we won't have much to worry about. But, yeah, let me know what you think. Uh, God bless. Have a good day. Bye. Anthony, thank you very much for the call. And, uh, David, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and say my piece real quick. Um I, the Buccaneers are not trading for anybody. There's there's nobody that's going to be available that they can bring in right now, number one, that they can afford. I realize they can work some salary cap magic, but there's, there's nobody out there that they're going to go out and get. I don't think Marcus May is a guy that they're going to bring in. Uh, you, you have Antoine Winfield, you have Jordan Whitehead, you have Mike Edwards. You're, you're fine at the safety position. If they traded for any position, it would be a corner but it would probably be a depth move rather than a starter move. Uh, Rojo is not being sent off anywhere. OJ Howard is not being sent off anywhere. Um, I don't think, I don't think a trade happens by the deadline for the Buccaneers. No, I agree with you. And I'm going to go one step deeper and get a little bit more detail, maybe perhaps a little over detail, but I tend to do that from time to time. So bear with me here. Sportingnews.com, One of my favorite sports websites actually went through and listed 15 specific trade targets that might be on the move. Uh, at or near uh, this NFL trade deadline, which is Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Hence the reason why the show is uh, right bracketed right around that deadline. Of course, quarterback Deshaun Watson is going to be a huge part of those conversations. Tua Tunga Bailoa is going to be a big part. Miami Dolphins defensive end Emmanuel Agba is one of the names. Allen Robinson, the Chicago Bears wide receiver, interesting name. Offensive tackle Andre Dillard from the Philadelphia Eagles. Broncos running back Melvin Gordon the third, which, hey, a, a big weekend this weekend from uh, Javante Williams might speed that up a little bit. Marlon Mack, running back from the Colts, has requested a trade. Kyle Fuller, cornerback from the Denver Broncos. LJ Collier, defensive end from the Seahawks. Marcus May, safety from the New York Jets. Melvin Ingram, edge rusher from the Steelers. Jamison Crowder, wide receiver from the Jets. Nick Foles of the Chicago Bears. Derek Barnett of the Philadelphia Eagles. Will Fuller, wide receiver from the Miami Dolphins. There's only one name on that list, James, that I think could even be remotely possible, and that's Kyle Fuller, the cornerback from the Denver Broncos. But again, you're starting to potentially get a little bit healthier, right? Sean Murphy Bunding has been out for a while, but he's also been healing, rehabbing. Carlton Davis, same thing. Richard Sherman is practicing again. Dee Delaney, you know, we'll see what happens with him. Ross Cockrell has been a consistent president. Jordan Whitehead has been able to play. Antoine Winfield Jr. is healthy again. 
eventually you're going to have to start trimming your cornerback group and your secondary back down because you're not going to keep all of these players that you've added to your active roster because of all these injuries. Eventually, you're going to have to let guys go. So you have to balance that a little bit. And winning has really been helping the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. If they weren't winning, I think it would be more likely. We have to remember, even with all the salary cap magic that they can work, Marcus May carries a $10 million price tag this year. Now, granted, some of that's already been paid out, so you're not going to in- inherit the entire $10 million. You're going to inherit a lot of money. Kyle Fuller's $9 million. So unless they're going to extend these guys or give them extended void years just for, for this season, I mean, I know it's all about winning right now, but again, as much as Buccaneers fans don't want to do it, even if you enter the bye at 6-2, and two, that, that's you're fine. You're, you're fine going into the bye at 6-2. You take week nine off. You get a little bit healthier. You've got a winnable match against the Washington football team. You don't need to panic. You don't need to mortgage future draft picks to do something right now because you're already plugging the holes very well. So, yeah, so I agree with you, but just getting a little bit more specific as to who could be out there and why it obviously kind of doesn't make sense unless you want Nick Foles. Tell me. Now, now I want the Bucks to trade for Allen Robinson. Just Well, yeah, I mean, of course. You yes, know what I mean? Uh, but All yeah, the weapons. But- but it's, all, it's not, it's not going to happen. All the weapons in the National Football League <laughs> just come to Tampa. They're just going to have a three-man uh, offensive line. Everybody else is an eligible receiver, <laughs> and Brady will have the ball out of his hands before the pass rush can get there. Um, yeah. It would take one game for Allen Robinson to surpass his entire season's worth of production. Yeah. And a great man once said, some men just want to watch the world burn. And Absolutely. That's me. And – that starts with Allen Robinson being traded to the Buccaneers. That would be hilarious. I would love to see it because Allen Robinson is a guy that honestly, he, he just gets a lot of credit that. of being underrated, but he doesn't get enough credit for being as good as he is. I honestly think from a talent standpoint, Allen Robinson might be a top five wide receiver yes. in the NFL, but he's never going to get that credit. Speaking James of people that just don't get enough credit. Let's hear from another Bucks fan. Hey guys, this is Kendall calling out of Orinda, California. Um, it's got, well, question and a, and a little anger here. Um, wondering why the NFL is not giving the Bucks credit for what's going on with the Chiefs because they're three and four. They got a losing record and nobody is like saying thank you because we gave them the formula how to beat the Chiefs and now no, nobody's giving us our praise. So I just want the NFL to be put on notice. We should get our, our fair share of credit for that all right thanks guys have a good one kendall thank you for the call um i will say this i'm going to start what i'm saying by giving credit where credit is due okay peter schrager on good morning football uh the monday after well i guess this past monday i should say they were talking about the titans and and the chiefs and the absolute beatdown that the titans gave them and peter schrager said the Buccaneers broke the Chiefs. The Titans just finished them off. Um, so he did give some credit there. But I think a lot of the reason why the Bucs aren't getting credit, and I'm, I'm not sure how much credit they deserve. I mean, it's fun to talk about like, oh, the Bucs defense broke the Chiefs because the Chiefs looked broken after that game. But that was eight months ago. So, I mean, how much credit does a team deserve for beating the Chiefs last season? It's been eight months. They've had more than enough time to put it behind them. They thought they made some roster improvements. The defense is still really bad. Um, But it's a new season. And so what the Bucs did in February really doesn't pertain too much to what they're doing now. I mean, they did lay out a little bit of a blueprint, but... How much of a blueprint can you lay out if your team isn't stacked the way that the Buccaneers is? So I don't know. To, to me, it's it's a whole lot to do about nothing, but I will give Peter Schrager credit for saying that the Buccaneers broke them before the Titans kind of poured salt in the wounds. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think what Todd Bowles did uh, is, is kind of what Kendall was talking about, kind of give teams a blueprint on how to attack the Kansas City Chiefs, and then people can kind of take that blueprint and say, okay, well, what are we missing that the Buccaneers have and how do we make up for that and how do we adjust our scheme? But a lot of this has also been self-inflicted wounds. Like, uh, again, you know, a lot of you guys know that I now cover the Washington football team as well. So I've seen the Kansas City Chiefs play because they played the Washington football team and they won that game. But 
what you may not know because you don't watch either team probably on a regular basis is that the Washington football team could have won that game. Absolutely could have won that game. And imagine the firestorm that would be going on around Kansas City if they lost to Washington football team uh, as well as the Tennessee Titans and, and and had even one more loss on their on their record. Um, but to be fair, the Washington football team didn't really do anything to cause the Chiefs to be able to lose that game. It was self-inflicted wounds, and that's really what's kind of been plaguing the team for a lot of this. Now, don't you know? Don't take too much away from the opponents. There's definitely opponents. The Tennessee Titans put a whooping on them. So I mean, that that wasn't self-inflicted. That was Tennessee Titans inflicted. Um, but a lot of these other problems are self-inflicted. And they're kind of starting to snowball. But I think the other part of this, James, is people aren't ready to admit that the Kansas City Chiefs may not be what they thought they were. I mean, remember, you go back to eight months ago, like they just beat they beat them eight months ago. How long ago that was? But really, it wasn't that long ago when you're talking about dynasty time, right? When you're talking about dynasty timelines, sure. eight months is not long at all. Eight months ago, the Kansas City Chiefs were being talked about as a dynasty. And this drove me crazy then. You know this. Uh, our listeners know this if they listen back to the postseason because it drove me crazy that a team and a quarterback, and I, I'm a fan of Patrick Mahomes. not a fan of his brother, but I'm a fan of Patrick Mahomes. That a quarterback with one Super Bowl win, the, the same as Trent Dilfer, Brad Johnson, right, and, and the like, was being talked about as a dynastic quarterback and a team in the Kansas City Chiefs with one Super Bowl win was being talked about as a dynasty team. And even if you win two, it's not a dynasty. You know what I mean? Like, even if you win two of them, you're not like Eli Manning has two Super Bowl rings and nobody's talking about him as one of the greatest quarterbacks of his era, let alone ever. You know what I mean? So I think the NFL narrative and a lot of people – in sports coverage kind of bought into it a little bit is it was the, the next coming of a, the next great NFL quarterback. And I talked about this during the off season or the pro the postseason last year, they're trying to set up the successor to Tom Brady as the face of the, of the, of the league, because they've had it easy. Tom Brady has been the face of this league for the last 20 plus years. It's simple. Every single year, it's all about Brady. That's what's going to work. We're going to sell tickets. We're going to put butts in seats. Brady's about to retire. Maybe <laughs> in the next 10 years, maybe. Um, so they're trying to set up the succession plan. And I'll give you an example here. The Lots on Podcast Network, we do power rankings every week, right? Kansas City Chiefs, 13th. James, 13th. Yep. And I can tell you right now, they haven't been in the top 15 in my personal, my voting of these power rankings in weeks. But they're 13th. And it, and you can't say it's just the Kansas City Chiefs, like locked on Chiefs hosts, right? Because they're, they're, just, they're just two guys. They don't carry that much weight to make them 13 when other people are putting them below even 15. That is why, because people are not ready to admit that they were wrong about the Chiefs yet. If they're not wrong about the Chiefs yet, then nobody broke them because they're not broken if they're not wrong. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of, I think that feeds a little bit of this. Well, and something else that I'll say real quick before we move on, it, it reminds me, honestly, of that meme that we saw circulating before the Super Bowl, where it was comparing Patrick Mahomes to Russell Wilson. Second yeah. full year as a starter, they win a Super Bowl. Third full year as a starter, they lose to Tom Brady in a Super Bowl, and Seattle hasn't been back since. Yep. And listen, let, and let's not let's not forget too that and 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 I hate to do this because it starts to sound like I'm trying to like pull away from what people have achieved, right? And I'm not. I'm really not trying to do it, but I'm trying to add some perspective here. The Kansas City Chiefs lost a Super Bowl very very handedly to a very well rounded, balanced defense that could attack you on all three levels. They won a Super Bowl against a team that relied on defense that could do the same. The problem is the road to the Super Bowl, the San Francisco 49ers defense got hurt a time. And, and I don't know if it was like every single week, you know what I mean? But I'm going to say time and time again, as the San Francisco 49ers are making it to the big game, they're losing key contributors on their defense. And by the time they get to the Kansas City Chiefs, they're just they're kind of a shell of themselves. So you're not really seeing the, the dominant uh, defense that San Francisco had at the time facing that Chiefs, you're seeing a shell of that defense facing the Chiefs and the Buccaneers, fortunately, right? And especially as we're winning right now, they had they had their full arsenal of weapons. So they were able to to use that and, and kind of expose the Kansas City Chiefs in that aspect. Well, they're disappointing, no doubt about it, but something that won't disappoint are built bars. I raced home from my son's hockey practice. I have not had anything to eat. I wolfed down a built bar on my way down the steps and into my office in the basement here. If you have not tried a built bar by now, you are the one that is missing out. They say it's protein bar. It doesn't taste like one. I, we've told you that over and over. You have to try one to believe it. 
But most protein bars, if you've ever had one, it's chalky, it's waxy, it's dry, it's it's just hard to choke down. You have to drink like a gallon of water just to make sure that it's not stuck in your throat. Built Bar Soft, it's covered in 100% real chocolate. When you bite into it, you know you're eating something different. They're low carb, low calorie, low fat, low sugar, high in protein all the healthy benefits on top of being just purely delicious. I ate a blueberry muffin one on my way down. It's, whew, it is neck and neck. That really legitimately might, might be my favorite. If you're not a blueberry muffin person though, they have coconut, raspberry, mint, brownie, coconut, almond, salted caramel, double chocolate, cherry, barcia, cookies and cream, peanut butter, brownie, and they're coming out with new limited time flavors every three to four days. So you have to check the website often so that you don't miss out. That website is built.com. You use our promo code LOCKED15, you're going to get 15% off your order. Again, LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5 for 15% off at built.com. wrapping things up here on a friday edition of the locked on bucks podcast james yarko david harrison we are talking buccaneers we are talking saints and we're talking about it on youtube make sure you head over to youtube subscribe to the channel we really appreciate it uh give us some of those thumbs up join in the comment section we'll pull questions out of the comment section shout out mad dog, mad dog. David, david let's go ahead and get into the keys of the game what do you have for us yeah, well, I mean, I mentioned the key to the game yesterday on the crossover with Ross Jackson. So, of course, if you haven't watched that episode or listened to it, please check that out or download that at your leisure and do so. Ross is always a great conversation uh, to have. Um, and and I said, like, that I think the target's got to be five yards per carry on first down. Whereas Leonard Fournette, Ronald Jones, Keyshawn Vaughn, Gio Bernard, Tom Brady, I don't care who's running the ball. You need, you know, every time, and I'm not saying run the ball on every single first down you get. So right. let's not get too crazy. And I understand Five yards per carry is a lot to ask for, but I think that just needs to be your target. That needs to be the horizon line that you got your eyes set on. If you can achieve it, you know, every every second or third first down, you run the ball, you pick up five yards. That's going to allow you to stay ahead of schedule. It's going to allow you to stay on the field as an offense. It's going to keep the Saints offense off the field. And if you continue to put up points the way that the Buccaneers offense have has, which is early and often, you're going to force Sean Payton's hand. He's going to have to let Jameis Winston throw more than he ever has this season. I think his season high right now in, th- in passing attempts is 30 to 32, somewhere around there. And it was against the Washington football team. You know why he had so many pass attempts? Because the, the New Orleans Saints had a lot of turnovers in that game, and it was too close for comfort, so they had to kind of throw the ball against that defense to try to keep up and try to keep uh, keep ahead of, of the Washington football team. They ultimately did. But again, this is a different beast. It's a totally different animal. The more pressure you put on the Saints to keep up, the more James Winston has to throw the ball. and. Uh, you know, look, we all love Jameis, but we know that's that's probably the best way to, to come out of a win. Well, and my key to the game is actually also playing into something that we saw Jameis Winston do a lot. And it's something that we've seen the Buccaneers defense do the past couple of weeks, and that is generate pressure. You start to get more and more pressure on Jameis Winston. That's when we've seen him make those mistakes. He'll force the throw too early. He'll he'll try to extend a play. It turns into an interception or a strip sack. So we need to see this defensive front continue to generate pressure, continue to make Jameis Winston uncomfortable. And if they can start doing that, you know, should the Buccaneers get a seven, a 10 point lead? If we're talking multiple scores here, then Jameis is going to be in a situation where he has to throw the ball. And I know Ross said on the crossover that he hasn't seen this Jameis that everyone talks to him about that turns the ball over. The Saints have been in fortunate situations most of the year, but that key game that you brought up, that Washington football game, they weren't in those situations. He was forced to throw the ball. That's when he had a couple of turnovers, and uh, you know it, it caused some problems. So Ross he, knows he's there. He knows. He he does. Deep down, he does. Not even deep oh. down, he knows. Yeah, because I mean, he didn't watch the Saints against the Bucks for five years and not know that that yeah. James is sitting in there. Um, but again, like I mentioned, when I, when I called in, he's on track for the best touchdown to interception ratio of his career. But again, it goes back to Sean Payton, mitigating risk, put the ball in Alvin Kamara's hands, keep it out of Jameis's as, as often as possible. You don't want to rely on him throwing 40, 45 times a game, the way the Buccaneers did. So pressure from the edge, Shaq Barrett, Jason Pierre, Paul, Joe Tryon, Shawinka, 
pressure up the middle if Levante David can go even better, but send Devin White on those screaming blitzes, generate pressure with those front guys and Indomitian Sue and Vita Vea. Get Jameis uncomfortable, and you are going to force him to make bad decisions and force him to make mistakes. Yeah. So with that, let's get into our predictive players of the game. And mine is a little out there. For once, I'm not taking Chris Godwin. I've I've given up trying to to make that a thing, even though he did get our uh, our locked on Bucks blessing of the week. My predictive player of the game is OJ Howard. Now stay with me, folks. Stay with me. All right. I'm not saying he's going to lead the team in receiving. I'm not saying he's going to lead the team in yards. I do think he's going to get into the end zone. But we know historically Mike Evans has struggled against the Saints more so than he does against the Panthers or the Atlanta Falcons. He's going to have Marshawn Lattimore over there. He's going to get some targets, but he's not going to explode. There is no Antonio Brown. So now you have Chris Godwin and you have a Rob Gronkowski coming back. So what are the Saints going to do? They're going to focus on shutting down Chris Godwin. They're going to focus on shutting down Rob Gronkowski. It is going to open up opportunities for an OJ Howard that we have seen get more involved in the offense over the course of the past couple of weeks. I think OJ Howard is going to make some crucial key catches in this game, especially late to move the chains. He's going to get into the end zone one time, and it is going to, it's going to be something that the Saints are not focusing in on and in, if they have to shift some of that focus over to oj well guess what now you can start hitting them with gronk and godwin and lenny out of the backfield and you know evans is going to get a handful of targets but it's not going to be one of these games that we've seen out of evans uh this season where he goes over 100 and, and multiple touchdowns so oj howard is going to be a pivotal part of this game yeah, I love it. And I'm going to start him in my dynasty league because I still have him in my dynasty league because he's still a talented young player. And Excellent. look, you know, OJ didn't he didn't have a lot of production last week, but we did see them try to get the ball to him, you know, and, and there was an attempt at least to get him going. So the, the effort is there uh, from from the team. So I think it's it's a good it's a good spot to start. I'm going to go with Vita Vea as my player of the game. And James, you kind of already talked about it. Pressure up the middle on Jameis Winston. Listen, Jameis Winston has looked better than he has in a long time this season. Again, I've watched him. I've had to study him for crossover episodes. So I've seen a lot of James Winston in this season, and he has looked better. And Sean Payton and that staff are doing a really good job of accentuating James Winston's strengths and avoiding some of his pitfalls, some of those panic moments and situations. But there's one thing that is going to undo all of that. We've been talking about it pretty much all week, and it's been a main focal point here today, and that is putting them in a position where they don't have a choice where Jameis Winston has to take chances, where they have to move the ball, they have to get points because they're under duress and because the Buccaneers' offense is putting them in a hole. So when that time comes, I look for Vita Vea to pick dudes up, put them in Jameis Winston's lap, make Jameis Winston make plays. That's what you want. You want the hero ball, Jameis. You're going to get some good throws. You're going to get some big plays. You might even get some touchdowns, but you're also going to get some takeaways. And listen, three out of 12 drives, in an NFL game is still 25% of your possessions. If the Buccaneers can steal 25% of the Saints' possessions in this game because of that pressure, because of the points you off, because the complimentary pressure that this Buccaneers team can put on them, then that's going to be huge, which leads into my bold prediction, which is that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to intercept Jameis Winston three times. And yes, I'm painting myself into a little bit of a corner because I am saying intercept instead of get takeaways strip sacks are obviously takeaways, but I am saying intercept because I'll tell you what I have seen from James Winston this year. James is a better sense of not holding on to the ball too long. Not saying he never does it just a better sense. He's throwing the ball away more. He's getting the ball out under duress more. So I think strip sacks are going to be a little bit less easy to come by compared to previous versions of James Winston. So interceptions are going to be the key and uh shout out to Evan Klosky for stealing my player of the week. I think Devin White comes up with at least one of those. Um, yeah, well, and and let's all hope that Richard Sherman could set foot on the field because if I remember correctly, the last time uh, Jameis Winston faced Richard Sherman, uh, Sherman picked one off and took it to the house. Did he not? Mm. He did. Mm. Um, my bold prediction. A bad day for your player of the week, by the way. We'll do what now? That was a bad day for your player of the week, if you remember. Uh, I don't remember. That was but. the same game that OJ Howard uh, 
Harlem Globetrotted a pass right to a 49ers defender. That's right. Because that pick six was the curl route to Peyton Barber, which I still don't understand. There's a lot of things I don't understand. What I do understand is that you and I are on the same page about this game, and that page is force Jameis Winston to beat you, period. You have to force the ball into Jameis's hands and out of the hands of an all-pro running back, and that is Alvin Kamara. Buccaneers gave up 100 rushing yards to Khalil Herbert last week. They are not going to make the same mistake again, and they know how important Alvin Kamara is in the passing game. Devin White is going to be all over it. Alvin Kamara, my bold prediction, he will be under 90 total yards and will not get into the end zone this week. If the Saints are going to win, it has to be because of Jameis Winston, and I don't think they're going to do it. David, the Bucks are going to win this game. My score prediction is 31 to 17. Yeah, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, at the time of this recording, of course, this line can always move over betonline.ag, four-point favorites to win on the road oh, in New down. Orleans in the Little Caesars Dome. Um, it's not the Little Caesars Dome, but that's a joke. Anyway, uh, Buccaneers 31-21 is my prediction, James. And uh, final topic real quick. Tom Brady, we've had a couple of Bucs fans hit me up and hit us up. Uh, on Twitter and other platforms about this. Tom Brady on Monday Night Football with the Mannings makes a comment about defensive players, and some people have had some very passionate uh, responses. Look at you, Dominique Foxworth, who basically threatened to beat up Tom Brady on the streets, um, talking about uh, defensive players basically not being the most intelligent players. Uh, what are your thoughts, and how do you think the Buccaneers' defensive players have been responding to Tom Brady during practices this week. I'm going to go ahead and assume that they don't care. For anybody that watched that whole thing, there were a whole lot of jokes being made. Um, Obviously, Tom Brady does not honestly believe that defensive players are morons, and he doesn't actually think they're like dogs chasing cars. There is some truth to the see ball, get ball aspect of the defense. We saw that with Quan Alexander. You know, he was really good at chasing down the ball carrier because he was always aware of where the ball was. But obviously, Tom Brady doesn't truly believe that, you know, defensive players are morons. Like, yeah. come on. And not for nothing, but right, see ball, get ball, click and close, those are terms that people like to use. They, those, and those alone, right, are not as simple as people think they are. Like, part of seeing the ball, right, especially when it's in a ball carrier's hands behind an offensive line is understanding tendencies. If I know that this offensive line likes to move right and try to get us to sweep and over pursue right so they can give us a back cut to the left, I'm going to see the ball by understanding those tendencies and being able to anticipate those tendencies. So you're understanding ratios and, and probabilities and all that other stuff, which is pretty complex. And then when you're pursuing a ball carry, especially if you're good at pursuing, what is that? That's angles, right? So you're talking about mathematics and you're talking about doing it in real time, using physics, taking adjustment for the opponent's speed, your speed, all those things. This is a very complex situation that, that the Buccaneers defense or that defenders in general are, are doing high pointing balls, tracking. Uh, one of the hardest things to do in, in the NFL is to catch a pass on the run, looking with your head straight up or looking over your shoulder, especially with a helmet and pads on. That's incredibly hard. Defenders do the exact same thing. And then and Peyton Manning said, Antoine Winfield Jr. is going to love to hear you say that. And Tom Brady literally laughed and said, yeah, yeah, you know, that's going to be a fun conversation. It's absolutely joking. Anybody out there taking this as anything other than athletes like people seem to forget sometimes if you're an athlete go back like these guys are athletes okay call them jocks call them whatever you want they're athletes i know like tom brady's at like the suits and the watch sponsors he's still a ball player like he's still a football player right he comes from football player roots eli manning right they, they had jokes and tom's like I, I really preferred playing peyton eli over you and eli was like yeah i liked our games you know what i mean they're ribbing each other like guys and, and not Bucks fans, right? Most Bucks fans understand this, but the people out there, the Dominique Foxworths of the world who were talking about, you know, I'm not going to be upset on the show, but find me on the streets or whatever. Like, come on, man. It's absolutely ridiculous. And some of these guys forget where they come from. They forget where other people come from and they're a little too sensitive. Yeah. I mean, 
Peyton Manning asked Tom Brady, what's the best way to stop the Bucks offense? And he asked for one-on-one -on -one coverage against Mike Evans and Antonio Brown. Like, yeah. obviously we know what's going to happen. How dare he insult Mike Evans and Antonio Brown, suggesting that they can't beat man-on-man -man coverage. Right. And, and not talk about Chris Godwin at all. I mean, just what an it's awful, terrible. awful human. It's terrible. Man. Terrible. Brady is. Um, all right. Hey, a win this Sunday. And I think the Buccaneers are back in number one in the locked on podcast network rankings because yeah. Arizona is getting worked right now by the Green Bay Packers. With that, we are getting out of here. Thank you once again for making Locked on Bucks your first listen or first watch every day free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Make sure you subscribe over there. We will be back on Monday with our reactions to the Buccaneers and the Saints. We want to hear your reactions, though. Give us a call at 813-444-5841. Make sure that your second listen is the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson give you the expert NFL analysis in less than 30 minutes. It is also free and available on all platforms. Check out everything that we're doing over at BucksNation.com. Follow along on Twitter at LockedOnBucks, at JRCO underscore Bucks, at DHarrison82, and at Bucks underscore nation hope you all have an absolutely outstanding weekend stay safe enjoy your halloween enjoy the trick-or-treating uh send us pictures of the kids what are the kids dressed up as send them over to at locked on bucks we want to see it stay safe stay healthy wash your hands be good to one another give all the dads all the Reese cups and we thank you so much for joining us right here at locked on bucks